Hello and welcome to the Greuter Conversations. I am Alexandra Koronkoy Kish, Editorial Communications Manager at De Greuter. And today I am delighted to welcome Earl Jeffrey Richards, Professor of Romance Literature at the Bergische Universität Wuppertal, and Renate Blumenfeld Kosinski, former Professor of Columbia University and the University of. Pittsburgh and president of the Medieval Academy of America in 2020-2021. Both of my esteemed guests today are foremost experts on today's topic, which in turn is linked to our celebration of Women's History Month. Welcome, uh, Renata and Jeff, and thank you very much for taking the time for our talk. Thank you. Thank you. So it's today's kind. conversation, yeah, we are delighted to have you on board. So today's conversation revolves around an extraordinary woman who lived some 600 years ago, but is still captivating researchers and people like myself all around the world, Christine de Pizan. Born in Venice as the daughter of a physician and astrologer, Christine de Pizan moved to Paris when her father accepted an appointment at the French court in 1368. By 1400, she was a distinguished and sought-after author, her work being received at the upper echelons of society and later translated into multiple other languages. Just last year, actually, um, de Greuter published her military and warfare treatise, uh, De Lise de Fédan et de Chevalerie, or Book of Deeds of Arms and Chivalry, together with its contemporary German translation, which was edited by Jeff Richards, together with Danielle uh, Bouchiger. So both of you, uh, Renata and Jeff, uh, have been researching Christine de Pizan for several decades now, actually, and uh, published copious scholarly works dedicated to her. And I was wondering, can you tell us a bit about how you discovered Christine de Pizan and what is it that sort of made you stick with her, if you, if you will, through, through all these years? Um, it started in the summer of 1978, just after I finished my PhD at Princeton, and Renata and I know each other as graduate students from Princeton, and I was working with an art historian in Princeton who had been working with George Braziller in New York, and she said, um, George Braziller's daughter, uh, daughter-in-law and, her, and son have a, a publishing firm, and they'd like to publish the book of the City of Ladies. And so that was how I started with Christine and came from my interest in Franco-Italian literature, uh, literary relations, and um, it sort of spiraled into everything after that. And <laughs> Renata and I are both students, the same uh, professor, and uh, so we have had a dialogue for decades. Yes. Oh, yes. I discovered Christine around the same time. But interestingly, not as a as a feminist, but as a historian, um, I was working on the story of Thebes, you know, Oedipus and all that for my dissertation. And I discovered Christine as a historian who had written about the story of Thebes. And so this was before I discovered her as a feminist writer. And that was through Jeff uh, and the City of Ladies. Uh, and the translation, the landmark translation that he made, and that opened up all Christine de Pizan studies. And then, of course, you know, with the growth of feminist studies, I got into Christine uh, much, much more. It, it really snowballed. Uh, nobody, <laughs> I mean, or it spiraled. I mean, nobody expected it. Yeah, I can, to... I can actually totally see that, how you can sort of step by step, the more you discover about her work, uh, the more kind of, fascinated you become and uh yeah you you kind of um reveal all the sort of uh, different facets uh that that there is to her okay. actually the first thing that sort of struck me about the story of of Christine um when I started to you know prepare for this interview was um amongst other things her extraordinary success as an author and I was thinking surely to become a highly regarded professional writer in the Middle Ages, perhaps especially as a woman, is uh, yeah no small feat. Um, and and then and then Jeff, you you also mentioned the fact that her 
her, her mother wanted Christine to kind of stick to uh, weaving and spinning rather than uh, learn how to read and write. And so putting all of that together, all these circumstances, I was just wondering, can you perhaps give uh, us a little bit of a background as to how she became this established writer of, of her time? Uh, she was connected to the Queen's court. Uh, the, the Queen of France was is Isabeau de Bavière, uh, who was actually a German princess, uh, uh, Elisabeth von, von Bayern. She was a, a Wittelsbach princess and the daughter, however, of uh, a Visconti from Milan. So that when Christine, as a Franco-Italian, came to Paris, she had a fellow bilingual Italian speaker in the Queen of France. And uh, one thing came to another, and through this entree into the royal court, uh, she came into contact with many of the leading intellectuals of the court. So she must also have had uh, some charisma, I think, sure. because it's not enough, you know, to be a, a good writer. But she had to kind of sell her stuff because she made a living from her writing, right? Which is the most. Yeah unusual thing because all the other writers that we know of the time, uh, Poissard, Machot, Philippe de Maizière, they all had appointments at court or at the church, right? So yeah. they had an income, a guaranteed income. And she, once she became a widow, she didn't, right? And so she started uh, really writing uh, for a public when she needed the money. And she managed, <laughs> right? To, uh, to get different factions of the court to support her. And especially later, right, during the Civil War, she, she sort of walked the line of the different factions and managed to survive with, with that income from different nobles at the time. That's an extremely important point. Christine, as a media, mediatrix is, is the term that's often used. She, she mediated between different factions of the court. So she was very sensitive to the politics of, of of everything that was going on between France and Germany, France, Italy, France and England. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I suppose her background as a, you know, her being a, a bilingual and also sort of a cosmopolitan. Um, exactly. And also of someone with uh, with really just just an incredibly broad spectrum um, of um of, of, of expertise, really, it seems to me. So she wasn't, uh, quote unquote, just a writer. She was a historian, which, which you've also uh, mentioned earlier, Renata. And, uh, you know, even the, the, the genres, um, in which she, in which she wrote, I mean, I was astonished to, to find, uh, uh, really the scope of her, um, yeah. also the output. She was also a poet, right? So, um, yeah, really quite extraordinary. So as we record okay. this, uh, it is uh, it is March, and we are celebrating Women's History Month, as I've uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, I was also delighted to find that Christine also had an interest in women's history and historical experiences. For instance, um, in her work, Athea's Letter to Hector, um, which is uh, what the two of you translated together. Uh, there is a, a, a particular take on that. So I was wondering, um, could you perhaps uh, say a little bit more about that? You know, what does she mean? Um, what, what does she understand by, you know, women's historical experiences? And the, what is the significance of that? Um, Renata and I came to the, I think, the, the perspective that Christine saw a woman's perspective on the nature of knighthood as extremely important because a woman could bring uh, wisdom to the whole idea of strength. So female wisdom, masculine strength, sapientia et fortitudo. Um, I think Renata can say more uh, on this than I. Well, for me, um, the most important thing about the Otea is also the title, right? because she created the figure of Utea. I don't know if you got a chance to look at the cover um, of, of our book, you know, where you can see the wise woman handing down wisdom uh, to, to the nobles, right? So number one, 
creating Otea as sort of an alter ego of Christine, handing down these lessons of of uh, wisdom. And I think, uh, Jeff, what you were suggesting was that she's sort of redefining uh, knighthood, right, uh, with an infusion of sagesse, uh, of wisdom. And I mean, that will become uh, more visible later, I guess, in the Livre des Fais d'Armes, right? Which yes. I don't know as well, uh, as well as you do. But there are a number of uh, figures, uh, you know, big female figures in the uh, in the Epitre du Théâtre. And interestingly, uh, three of them represent the Trinity, for example, right? Mm. You have uh, chapters where uh, Diana is interpreted as God and uh, Ceres, I think, as the Holy Spirit. So suddenly the whole universe, the, the mythological universe is transferred into a Christian context with important female figures representing sort of the male religious ideas. And, it, and then the very famous um, mi miniature showing Diana teaching the women to read. And it, Diana, Diana portrayed um, as the Virgin Mary um, with the book and the other uh, portrayal of, of Minerva as two goddesses as, as Christine says in, in the OTA, actually it's one goddess, but she shows two figures, uh, a woman armed and a woman with a book and, and look, looking like the Virgin. Uh, exactly. And the last chapter, so there are 100 chapters in the OTA, each chapter divided in text, gloss, and allegory. And the very last chapter shows us the Sibyl, the female prophet, teaching the emperor Augustus. Right, <laughs> so you couldn't get any more clear nah. on what women's role is uh, in the political life. It's a very polite listen, boys. <laughs> Thanks. <Exactly. laughs> so, in the Fédam, um Christine also gives us um, gives the readers very kind of hands-on um, practical advice when it comes to military tactics and uh, waging war, really. But oh, she also raises the matter of uh, of a just war, so to speak, even, uh, and I think you argued that, Jeff, uh, um, even sort of articulating the very concept of, of what a crime against humanity is. So there is this uh, sort of dichotomy of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the humanist and, and the military expert, if, if you will, can you maybe illuminate that a little bit? What is this uh, concept? Well, um, the first two books in the Fade Down, uh, Christine just gets down and dirty in terms of military tactics. Just one very fast example. She talks about how uh, excrement is used as a protection against the newly invented technology of cannons. And she says, well, you can, you can fill quilts with excrement and hang them on the castle walls and that way they'll buffer the cannon shots or you can put uh, excrement on top of these siege machines so that the besieged firing fiery arrows will not be able to uh, uh, make these siege machines machines catch fire that, that that's totally down and dirty and she talks about everything technical then, in the last two books, she switches completely to talk about very specific terms of, uh, of military law, the law of war. Um, mm -hmm. She had uh, begun the book with talking about what constitutes a, a, a justly fought war, but in the last two books, she talks about specific questions, safe conduct and, and other things, and then she talks about the treatment of civilians captured yeah. and this is where she comes to the question of, of inhumanity uh, and, and, and the use of Greek fire which she considered um, uh, to be a crime she calls it specifically a crime against humanity what is this it's, Greek fire actually I was wondering um, as, I, as I read this it's 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 a for it's a forerunner of napalm uh, that was used in naval combats that you you can't extinguish napalm with water and it was, uh, it was, it predates, I mean, it goes back to the eighth century, the Byzantines used it in naval combat. And it was, it was used 
for, uh, for instance, uh, on the siege of Cologne in the in, in the 10th or 11th century, and the Bishop of Cologne writes, uh, the Archbishop of Cologne writes about this as well. Um, so it was well known, but Christine says this is a crime against humanity because you can't yeah. use this against Christians, she says. And yes, it's... I, could I ask you a question? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. What kind of research uh, did Christine do uh, to, because she used Vegetius, right, as the source, and then she updates it to the to the late uh, Middle Ages. What kind of research did she do? Do we know who she talked to or how she found out all these technical things? Yeah, uh, I was just going to ask that as well, actually, <laughs> because you do wonder, especially when it comes to really these uh, quite literally t um Dirty tips and tricks, uh, how she sort of got to have this uh, this sort of practical knowledge, right? Uh -huh. um, she, she was interviewing people, and she even says this in the book. She was interviewing uh, high-ranking military uh, officers at court, and she says they prefer not to be named. Um, <laughs> it's, it, through a process of elimination, we can identify some of the individuals who were one of the heads of the king's cavalry, for instance. But it's um, it's really a guessing game. But she she brings in details that are not in, in Vigatius. Vigatius is a text from uh, the first century in Latin, mostly about tactical infantry tra tactics. Christine expands Vigatius to speak about procedure and uh, siege tactics, and um, that's uh, it's it's clear that she is is speaking to. Um, people at court because there are chapters in in the stay down where she just gives a list of what an army on the move needs and it's, it's like she's taking dictation uh, oh. in that case in in the second uh, part of the book the last two two books uh, it seems as though she's engaged in a ongoing dialogue with uh, people at court about legal issues it seems her major source here is author named Honorat Gouvat, and uh, he was at court. Uh, Christine seems to have known him, um, but there's just an enormous amount of, of erudition that's involved here, and Christine is actively asking questions. I, I don't know if that's a complete answer, but it's, it's yeah. the beginning of an answer. Doesn't Absolutely. the of Gouvet appear to her? Yeah, that, that's that's the whole allegory that she, right. she, so she, she put her. She has uh, information from the afterworld, right? In the figure of a ghost. I think that's absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So I, I was mean, wondering it, about, uh, um, because we've also mentioned the fact that, you know, this this work was translated uh, into High Alemannic, but you've also mentioned that it was translated into uh, Middle English. And uh, so can you can you maybe tell us about a little bit um, the about the reception of this work, contemporary reception? There are over 30 manuscripts in work, and they divide into two groups. One group, which specifically names Christine and stays with the format of a woman speaking about war. And then there's a second group of manuscripts where Christine has been suppressed as the author and where the, uh, the, the initial prayer and the nerve where Christine speaks about her position as a woman talking about war has been dropped. Um, but the work was well known throughout uh, Europe and England. Um, the Middle English translation was done by Caxton himself, the famous printer, published in 1389, and is considered to be one of the first bestsellers of the English language. The Middle High German or High Alemannic uh, translation is uh, either from it's it's hard to decipher the numbers. It's either thirteen fifty three or thirteen eighty three or fourteen uh, fifty three or fourteen eighty three, and it was done in Bern um, about twenty years before uh, Bern declared independence from the empire. So it seems to have been received in very specific contexts across Europe uh, at the end of the One Hundred Years War, and it was. It was it was well received and and widely uh, cited in other sources. Yeah, so you've also um, I, I find that really 
interesting how there is, uh, as you said, these two groups of manuscripts, if you will. Yes. And so um, you've you've shortly mentioned uh, this one manuscript where um, she she even uh, writes her own name down, uh, and that was something rather uncustomary at the time, wasn't it? Um, she is very keen on making sure that people know that it is Je Christine, I Christine, who am writing this. And in the in, particularly in the second half, um, but the the ghost uh, Bouvet addresses her as, as Ami and as Christine, and um, that's it's, it's very important that she says I am speaking here as Christine, and she uses this phrase later. In her last work, when she speaks of Joan of Arc, when she begins her her Dietje de Jeanne d'Arc, piece of poetry about Jeanne d'Arc, I, Christine, who have been in this abbey for so and so many years, but she begins with Je, Christine, and she uses that term very specific specifically to emphasize her position as a woman speaking uh, with erudition and with authority. Yeah, when you look at the tradition of of women writers in the Middle Ages, right? When I taught a course, I tried to uh, I taught a course called Women's Voices, right? From um, from the Middle Ages to the present, and when you look at the writers before Christine, they were mostly religious writers, right? Uh, so she's uh, the rare uh, secular writer after Marie de France from the 12th century. But doesn't Marie also say Marie je suis de France? <laughs> If I remember it correctly, but that's yes. centuries before. So there's a gap, right, between the 12th and the 15th century where we have no really named record of any any women writers. You know, there are some female troubadours, but we don't really know much about them. So she's the first writer of whom we have a biography, a, a history, and we know so much more about her. And also, you know, the fact that she supervised the production of her manuscripts, right? As you uh, point out, uh, the, the illuminations, for example, in most of her manuscripts were done under her supervision, right? So when you have uh, these images of women giving wisdom, for example, in the Otea, right? We can see the designer uh, behind that, I think. Um, uh, and here, the, the, the Jacques Christine part uh, also involves um, an incident that she describes uh, becoming a writer. Uh, she says her husband died and she was a widow, and that fortune came to her and transformed her into a man. And she says, I was a true man, I was a perfect man, and but I still kept my name, which contains the name of the most perfect man. And so she... I mean, this is this is where she is a secular writer, but also incorporating religious elements. Uh, where uh, she she wants people to know, I am a kind of universal uh, human figure. I'm a woman who has become a man, and mm -hmm. uh, it's it's an amazing uh, uh, jump, could, you could say. <laughs> Right, well, but I, what I found so striking was that when she starts the Cité des Dames, the city of ladies, she abandons this idea of having become a man. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I would just want to give one little uh, concrete example, if I may. When she talks about her transformation into a man in the mutation of fortune, she says, I was stronger and lighter, plus fort et léger, right? And that's from Ovid's uh, text, the transformation of Iphis into into a man. And then she uses the exact same wording in the Cité des Dames and says, okay, I am for et légère, and I'm now going to build the city of women, right? But now she's building as a woman. A woman, yes. And that, I, I... which is just so, so interesting. Uh, you know, she, as if she is reversing, right. she's reversing her transformation because now she is established enough to work as a woman, right? Is that and, uh, and she shows the picture of, of, of her lifting stones with the other virtues. Okay. You know, in, in the in the frontispiece of the Cité des Dames, you have first the three virtues appearing to her, and then in the, in the facing picture of the frontispiece, you have them all working together on the wall. 
Right. And then there's also the the Queen's manuscript, uh, right? Where yes. she but there are also some some pretty um concrete forms of self-representation or, or self-portraits as a writer. You know, she's sitting yes. at her cathedral or in, in, in her study, uh, and she has uh, this this um uh, it's really quite hefty book open and she's clearly writing it, you know, uh, so that that I also found quite, uh, quite extraordinary. And especially in light of the fact that, you know, she was the one supervising all aspects of manuscript production, including, um, yes. in, including these um, illustrative aspects of it. You can really see that she had her eyes on, um, on basically her own um, promotion, if you will, or at least representation and you know, authorship uh, as such. She yeah. had a unique position. I mean, she really was a unique writer. Um, and, and I think her contemporaries knew that. Absolutely. Just an incredibly multifaceted, not just writer, but person, really, uh, I would argue. So I yes, was really yes. delighted to, to, you know, have this opportunity also to find out about her a little bit myself and well, through this uh, this interview, I hope also our um, listeners and and readers. So, thank you very very much for taking the time today to reveal all these uh, fascinating bits and pieces about Christine. I'm sure that we could uh, sit here for for hours and uh, and keep unpacking this um, this wonderful story. Um, but yeah, for now, I I thank you for your time and uh, yeah. Um, Thank you very much for the interview. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.